Hi! Welcome back to Love at First Right. I'm Victoria Doherty, who is historically, or has been historically, a historical fiction writer, a Cold War historical thriller writer, to be, um, to be more specific. And I am endeavoring to write a romantic series now, one that is filled with thrills and adventure and history and archaeology and above all, a love story. And um, and this is quite a left turn for me. So Love at First Ride is my blog that, that is chronicling those endeavors. And here we don't just talk about, um, you know, romantic stories or thrillers for that matter. You know, we talk about what makes a great story, what makes very specifically a great series, because um, I think it's quite dif different when you are writing, say, something that is just thematically linked, like with my Cold War thrillers, or when you're writing something about two specific characters or, you know, a group of characters that your reader now follows from book to book to book. So, damn it, those, those characters better be compelling. And today, what I want to focus on is actually something that, that would... Um, and benefit uh, writers in general, even nonfiction writers, for heaven's sake, because I think it's something that really um, is universal, and that is nailing the first page, nailing that launch, uh, which now more than ever, ever is just absolutely critical because modern readers are tired readers, and, and there is just so much competition out there that if you cannot really draw a reader in from the first couple of paragraphs, from the first sentence, ideally, but, um, but you know, just from, from that launch, from that first page, um, you will have a difficult time retaining them because if they can put the book down that early on, if they can put it down and, you know, go do something else, I think that we have failed. And this is a really, really important topic for me because um, I'm a slow burn. This is actually a huge, huge challenge for me. You know, some people really start out strong um, and then, uh, you know, might might have a hard time, might struggle in the middle or um, might fizzle out. I think a lot of writers that I've talked to have said that, that they're really good at starting out strong, but then, um, you know, they, they run into trouble later on. For me, I'm... I'm just, I'm kind of the opposite. I really gain steam as I go. And so when I go back and rework the beginnings of my books, um, my stories, I, I, I have to do that through editing and really reconfigure them as um, the story becomes complete. And as we talked about with world building last time, I write very elaborately, especially in the first book of a first series, right? Because then I whittle it down because I've got to know what's going on. I've got to know the backstory, but you do not always want to burden the reader with that. And that is particularly, particularly, excuse me, true of the first page. When you nail that first page, when you are sure of your character's voice or of the voice of the story because you know if you're writing from the first person you are writing in your character's voice and and if you as a writer are telling the story from from a bit of a distance if you're writing in third person for instance then the story itself has to have a very very strong um point of view. And by point of view, I don't necessarily need, mean a political point of view. I, in fact, think that that can be really, really boring. <laughs> but, um, but you know, a strong sense of, of um, what the world looks like, either in this story or for this character as he looks out into the world and onto that story and how they are then going to move through that story and what this story is about. A reader has got to know what they're in for in that first page, because if you're too opaque about it, if you're trying to be coy, um, it is frustrating for the reader. And um, a lot of times we're not even trying to be coy, but, you know, we're trying to tell the story and we're trying to give the reader as much possible information as possible before you tell them what it's about. But um, that too can lose a reader because then they're like, why are you telling me all you know, why can't you scatter this perhaps through through the story? You know, tell me right off 
what is going on here? Um, I do want to read the launches of a couple of classics, really two of my favorite launches of all time from two very different authors, very different stories, uh, very different types of stories. But um, I think that in, in both cases, they, they really do, uh, they've taught me so much and have helped me when I go back, you know, when I'm trying to make my, my launch interesting through editing, um, I always keep these two launches in mind so that, um, I can I can capture the essence of what what the uh, what the authors were trying to do with those launches and hopefully apply that to my own story, my own point of view, my own uh, work and and the point of view of my characters. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read um, the first paragraph of Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep. I think if you've been watching this series, you know what a huge Raymond Chandler fan I am. I think that he is just a freaking master and that I think that he actually deserves to be called literary fiction and not just genre fiction because he's so darn good. And, um, you know, here is a man who I think is so gifted at being sparse and never mincing his words and telling you exactly what's going on. Um, all the time what, uh, he's just so direct His characters are so direct, but without being Boring. They are um, just direct in the most, uh, you know, Sam Spade, for instance, is just so direct in the most masculine kind of way. Um, one that um, doesn't flinch. And that's what makes him such an interesting character from the get go. It was about 11 o'clock in the morning, mid October, with the sun not shining and a look of hard, wet rain in the clearness of the foothills. I was wearing my powder blue suit with dark blue shirt, tie, and display handkerchief. Black brogues, black wool socks with dark blue clocks on them. I was neat, clean, shaved, and sober, and I didn't care who knew it. I was everything the well-dressed private detective ought to be. I was calling on four million dollars. That's an incredible launch. Um, not only does it tell the reader exactly what they're in for, this is a detective story for heaven's sakes, and you've just met the detective, and he's clean, shaved, sober, and doesn't care who knows it, which immediately tells you that that's not usually what he looks like, right? So we automatically have a real flavor for this guy as a hard-drinking, hard-living, smart, and smartly desperate dressed private detective who knows how to clean up, who knows how to clean up really well. And he's calling on $4 million, which at the time that Chandler was writing this, $4 million was an outrageous amount of money. So that instantly telegraphed to our reader, wait a minute, you know, first of all, the reader's going, wait a minute, this is a private dick who's usually running out after people who are you know, unfaithful husbands and unfaithful wives. When is, you know, $4 million going to come into this? What is this about? You know, it tells you right off, this is a big story. This is an unusual day for this character and he's dressing for it. He's sober, damn it. So, um, you know, I mean, just gold standard for um, a story, any story, frankly, but especially a story of that genre, because if you are writing genre fiction too, I think it is absolutely imperative that um, your reader, uh, that you telegraph to your reader the genre in the first page, because that's why um, genre fiction readers read specific genres. There are certain things that they come back to time and again, and they want to know that you're going to deliver them. Now, the second one that I'm going to read is Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita, the launch of Lolita. Um, very controversial novel <laughs> for obvious reasons, and it's also literary fiction, which is a bit different um, because literary fiction is you know, character driven. Um, the plot is, while well, certainly important and is certainly there, is incidental because it is about what happens to this person. And, um, I, you know, first, literary fiction, I think, has gotten a really uh, bad rap and, and deservedly so the last few years because it's become navel gazing um, and uh, highly politicized and it's boring. That's just boring. I think it's, it, it, that is interesting to a very small set of people. And usually even those people will say they've read those books and will have them on their shelf, but aren't actually reading them. Um, and 
I just think that there there has been a proliferation of books like that um, in so-called literary fiction, and that literary fiction has really gotten away from great storytelling, which is a shame to me because uh, I love a great story, and so do most readers out there. Most readers aren't there, aren't just looking to put a book on on their shelf and say, "Yeah, I read that." Um, so let me read to you, uh, you know. The first couple of paragraphs of Lolita, and they are short paragraphs, and get ready to be amazed. Lolita, light of my life, fire of my loins, my sin, my soul. Lolita, the tip of the tongue taking a trip of three steps down the palate to tap at three on the teeth. Lolita. She was low, plain low in the morning, standing four feet ten in one sock. She was Lola in slacks. She was Dolly at school. She was Dolores on the dotted line. But in my arms, she was always Lolita. Did she have a precursor? She did indeed. In point of fact, there might have been no Lolita at all had I not loved, one summer, a certain initial girl child. In a Princeton by the sea, oh, when? About as many years before Lolita was born as my age was that summer. You can always count on a murderer for a fancy prose style. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, exhibit number one is what the seraphs, the misinformed, simple, noble-winged seraphs envied. Look at this tangle of thorns. Well, that's amazing. <laughs> and, um, it, you know, and it is what's so incredible about it is, for one, it also lets you know immediately what you're, you're in for, who this person is. And it immediately hooks you with a huge surprise. First, he's talking about Lolita, love of my life. Oh, you know, this is this a love story? What's he talking about? And then you find out a couple se sentences later that she's just a little girl and that this is a pedophile who is in love with little girls. And there had been a precursor to Lolita. He'd fallen in love with a little girl years before, and that's what, what predicated all of this. And that's what probably got him into this mess in the first place. And you know, first of all, that he's a murderer. He tells you that. And when he says, ladies and, the gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you know he's in big damn trouble. This life is a huge mess. And you are just sitting already at the edges of your seat saying, tell me more. What, tell me what happened. What got you to that place? Oh, you know, absolutely riveting stuff. And it's the kind of stuff that that we have got to really sit down and think about before we write our first page, you know, before, you know, we endeavor to to make that launch and to grip our readers, to grab them by the hair, grab them by the lapels, do whatever we need to do, drag them into our cave. Um so that and hold them and not hold them hostage they've got to want to absolutely want to be there so that um they um will uh they will stick with you and not just through that story but you know like in my case with writing a series through this entire series and i think that we really do have to think about the three things that we must in part say in the first couple of paragraphs um and uh, I think that has to be, you know, what is going on? Whose story is this? And why do I care? Those three questions absolutely must be answered as quickly as possible, ideally in the first paragraph, but never after the first page. So this is what I'm trying to do. This is what I'm endeavoring to do. And this is one of my greatest challenges and what I have to work on most. And um, I will be posting um, the first few paragraphs of, of my novel, Breath, on Patreon. I am Victoria Doherty on Patreon. Patreon is you know, a, a wonderful uh, platform for connecting um, writers and readers or artists and, and their um, their fans. Uh, and it's a very reasonable way to support an artist as well. And um, I love to put excerpts up there and, and all sorts of uh, specially curated content for um, 
for uh, those who, who do follow me on Patreon. And I so, so appreciate your feedback because I just get tremendous feedback from readers who have often um, either pointed me in the direction or just stopped me in my tracks and said, no, 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 turn around. This is what you need to be writing about and um, have, have made me aware of things that perhaps I was too close to see. So um, anyway, I'll put the link in um, the comments or somewhere here in, in, in uh, the introductory uh, uh, statement um, under this, this blog post. Have a great one.